everybody, and welcome to Gen Friends. I'm your host, Sherry Hudson Passy from Carolina Girl Genealogy. And as usual, I have this fabulous panel with me tonight. We're excited about our talk. Before we get to that, let's introduce the panelists. We've got Shelly Murphy, our family tree girl. Hi, Shelly. Hey, everybody. Good to be here tonight. I'm not in Virginia, though. I Where are you? Florida. All right. All right. Well, thank you for joining us all the way from Florida. Yes. We're glad that you're here. We've got Laura Hedgecock from Treasure Chest of Memories. Hi, Laura. Hi. I am in Michigan where I normally am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're here. We've got Melissa Parker, the archive lady. Hi, Melissa from Texas. <laughs> Texas? How about Tennessee? Texas? I'm in Tennessee. Texas? Oh, my gosh. And I know this. I know this. I don't know where that came from. I must be thinking about Texas for some weird reason. So glad to be that. here. Very excited about tonight's program. Yes. yes, and I promise she really is. And I know she's from Tennessee. Yeah. <laughs> he knows that Melissa's from Tennessee. Had a brain thing, which I have a lot. Anyway, so last but not least, we've got Bernice Bennett from Ginny B. Roots. And I'm introducing Bernice last because she is going to be our guest tonight. <laughs> she is going to talk to us about the Freedman Bureau records. And if you don't know what those records are, you're in for a treat because Bernice is going to talk to us all about them. She's going to explain them to you, how to find them and how to use them to find your family. So take it away, Bernice. Well, thank you so very much. And you said the Freedmen's Bureau. So mm -hmm. I want to go start off with what the, the actual name is Okay, uh, that we call the Freedmen's Bureau. And it's the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands, also known as the Freedmen Bureau. Okay. That's a lot of things incorporated into this one. It's, a, it's a lot of things because when you think about the war is over, you have the refugees who are, who are the poor whites. You have mm -hmm. the freedmen who are the formerly enslaved. And of course, you have all of this land in the Confederate States that, that really is abandoned. And mm -hmm. so this bureau was created to do several things. First of all, they, um, they focused on abandoned and confiscated property. What, what were they gonna do with that? Uh -huh. Then you had these formerly enslaved people that needed food, that needed clothing, that needed uh, lodging, and also they needed jobs. It, the intent was to start paying people for things that they did free. And so you had, you had programs that were created to take care of that. And then, of course, you had the refugees, the people who mm -hmm. were destitute, who needed rations, also, they needed jobs. They also needed housing and basically the same thing. Mm -hmm. So these records were created. It's called Record Group 105. And most of the records, at least all of the records now are on microfilm. Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about, well, how do you find these records? Each record group or at least each state has a catalog that was created by NARA, by the uh, National Archives. And in these catalogs, they basically break down what you can find in each state. And so you have field offices and uh, Tony Carrier and Angela Walton Raji created Mapping the Freedmen Bureau. Mm -hmm which means that that's how you could find the various field offices. And with mm -hmm. these field offices comes a lot of information. So I spoke the other day um, and I was on the legacy webinar speaking about labor contracts. That was my focus on labor contracts. Now, of course, I could have focused on rations. I could have co focused on letters of complaint. I could have focused on the registries that they created for uh, people, but I decided I was gonna focus on labor contracts because this provided what we would think would be a significant opportunity for the formerly enslaved 
to make money and become self-sufficient. Mm-hmm. This is what this is what it was all about. Right. But one of the things that I I really feel that people need to understand is that there were certain rules, uh, general orders, various circulars that were developed for each of the states. And some of those circulars where people may not be aware of were created in consultation with the planters. So let me tell you who the planters are. The planters are the plantation owners, some of whom are former slave owners. Mm -hmm. And so they came up with some of these rules and regulations that they would expect the freedmen to agree to and Mm -hmm. to sign their X or to put their signature. And so what you have are documents for each of the planters, which in in some cases, there was a form that they filled out, you know, specifying the expectations for each of the freedmen. In some cases, they would just write out something, just handwritten and say, okay, put your X on here. Right. And so right. this is this is what I would really like people to do. And I think that the, the more you study these documents, the better you become. Because while I can tell you about these documents, you know mm-hmm. how I am, Sherry. I'm one of those. I'll <laughs> tell you about them and then I'll That's say right. you get it to them. You That's read right. them. You study them and really get a feel for what the expectations are of Mm -hmm. the planters and the freedmen. So that's what I'm I'm all all about telling you. Now, there's also a provision in some of the circulars for education, that some of the funds would be used for education, Mm -hmm. that some of the funds would be used for lodging, for food. For shoes, they would even write how many pairs of shoes people would get, you know, one pair of shoes a year. Uh, The work hours that you would start work in the summertime, first thing in the morning, you work 10 hours. In the wintertime, it would be different. Mm -hmm. Uh, They would have various classifications of the workers, you know, which was really merit-based. The men If you looked at some of the circulars, you would see the men would get paid more than the women. And of course, the women would get paid more than the children. So all of that's laid out so that when someone looks at um, a labor contract, they will see the name of the laborer, the -hmm. classification, the age, the sex, the money. And then they will see that they have put their X next to the agreement. Wow. I can't imagine that these agreements, I mean, they weren't very good. They probably weren't getting much more than working for free. I mean, they were getting something so that they can say that they were trying to follow the law. But I can't, I can't imagine that lifestyles changed too much considering who was writing the contract. <laughs> When you start reading the contracts, some of those contracts, you will actually see the word obedience. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, you must be respectful to the Mm -hmm. white person. I mean, it's written Mm -hmm. in the contract. Basically, and obedient. Obedient, yes. Uh And so you start reading this and immediately you say, wait a minute these people are back in slavery. Yeah, yeah. And you and you and then, you know, I tell people don't jump from the 1870 census to the slave schedule. Go to the Freedmen Bureau records to see if you can find your ancestors. But this is the this is the catch here. If you don't know who you're looking for, then the Freedmen Bureau records won't help you, which means that you have to do some genealogy first. You have to know and understand where your ancestors are in order for you to say that you have found them. Uh If you don't know who you're looking for, you won't know that you found them. You see, so so we're talking about some serious work here, but work that will pay off but you have to have a beginning point. 
And that now, beginning Janice, how, point comes from sorry. the, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, so you're trying to find your people and you're trying to figure out where they are. So maybe you could find them in these contracts. So then would the step be to go to where you think they were, look at the different planters, their wills, and see if you can find names and then see if those names end up with the same planter and the same uh, contracts. Is that uh, one way to do it? Or are we assuming too much? Well, I it may be assuming too much. Mm -hmm. My my recommendation is you know what community, where were your people? Mm -hmm. Know the community first. Then I would recommend that you look for labor contracts in your community. Mm -hmm. Once you identify the labor contracts, then start reviewing them. Gotcha. And, and that'll help you. I mean, I look at this as really a project for a society. Mm. And I mean, my, my own genealogical society is in Louisiana. And mm -hmm. I pulled all of the labor contracts for my society. And it, that was helpful because then we could see who the, who the, the plantation owners were. Mm -hmm. But if you don't even have that piece of information, you know, where do you begin? So that that's one of my recommendations. Start where your folks are from. And I knew where my folks were from in Louisiana. So it was easy for me to say, well, I'm going to go to that parish first. Mm -hmm. If they're not there, then I'm going to look at the, the parish next to them. Right. And see where they yes. were, you know. And then and just really that's to, basic, yeah. basic genealogy one-on-one. -on -one. Start with what you know. You know, one on one, stay with, start with what you know, and then add to that knowledge. Absolutely. Um, I'd like to quickly uh, welcome Mary. Mary Kucharati has, has, has joined. I just want to say hi. Uh, <laughs> acknowledge that she's jumped in. Good to have you here, Mary. Um, Melissa, you've got a question. Um, yeah, I don't want to um, interrupt Bernie. She's doing such a great job because I have a gazillion questions, but <laughs> um, um, what if someone says to you, um, I have poor whites. I don't know if I have refugees, but I know I don't have plantation owners. Um, I have done my research. I don't have slave owning um, whites in my family. Would this be a record source that I do have poor whites in my ancestry? It's something that I might consider? Absolutely. Because if they, after the war, if they needed assistance, if they needed rations or clothing or what have you, then that would be documented. And you would find that because there's a ration list and they had to account for all of the rations that were provided to people. And so I would say, yes, the Freedmen Bureau is for poor whites and it's for the Freedmen. That's it's good to federal, know because it's a, it's I think a federal some document, Melissa. Yeah, I, 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 I knew this, but I'm just yeah. doing it for our for our watchers and listeners because yeah. I think sometimes um, they it tends to be put under the auspices of um, former mm -hmm. enslaved, and so right. I wanted you know, others to know that this is a resource that we should not overlook. Absolutely. Um, and so, Absolutely. and so I'm, I'm, I love it when Bernice talks about this and Shelly too, because they, they, they not only talk about the enslaved, but they talk about the opportunity to find records for those poor whites or refugees as well. All right. And I said to people, read every word in every document that you find, because I've actually seen a Freedmen Bureau record and it had one white person on it, a labor contract with one white person from Mississippi. So you need to look at that. And they specify white. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so this I'm is something sure everybody that everybody knew. Everybody <laughs> knew, yes. But that person needed, need, needed yeah. a job. They needed a place to stay. Mm -hmm. And so they agreed to the terms of the contract. It's Fabulous. my favorite record set. I absolutely, for the work that I do, um, I couldn't do it without it because I have to toggle between that time period she mentioned about after the war to 1870 because we've got people, you know, like I said, white and formerly enslaved 
And some of them have their full names, but I also could see plantation names, you know, uh -huh. so you're getting locations, you're getting names and the records to me are just amazing. And the information that we can, can pull off of them. And, and I've mentioned this type record, she talked about rations and mm -hmm. there was actually, it was a Louisiana record mm -hmm. and, um, I, I read it and I use it in presentations, but it had a list of people that were getting rations. Mm -hmm. But what I was seeing was their names. I saw their ages. I saw mm -hmm. the former owner and I saw location. But let me back up a moment. When I saw ages and I'm already starting to tear up, there were 200, just one, just one record. Just as an example, there were two 100 year olds on there. Now wow. there's like three 80 some year olds and, and the rest were in seventies and forties and things. And mm -hmm. I had to sit back because again, I started tearing up and I thought, oh my God, this person was, had, you know, was born before the revolutionary war because the uh -huh. record was in 1866. And then they had been probably enslaved their whole life. Mm hmm and now they're destitute and they're getting rationed, but they live to see freedom. Yeah. And, and one yeah. other thing that I thought because of their birth, being 100 years old, this could have been the one from Africa. Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. That timing. Yeah. In oh, fact, wow. Shelly, I think that what you will find, and as you mentioned, 100 year olds, 70 and 60 year olds, they most likely were from Africa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, the part that makes me really tear up, though, is when you see in a contract that the ch a child is also mm -hmm. by, you know, they are having the parent sign over the child. Yes. And uh, a nine-year-old child. And that child is there to work until for a year. And that's sad because you also find some of those children being taken from their parents. And then when you look in the complaints, because they can file complaints, the parents are saying, but I did not turn my child over to you. Right. But they did their ex. And remember, you're dealing with an illiterate population. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. They don't know what they're really signing because somebody is reading and saying, sign it or leave. Right. So you have no yeah. choice. You are put in a situation where this is the reality that they are living with mm -hmm. until they can do better. And then you see them moving from the labor contract to the sharecropping system. Mm -hmm. And then again, that, that's bringing on a whole nother group of problems. But some of those agreements were sharecropping. Uh, oh, yeah. Cut up exactly the same way. Exactly. <laughs> baffled at that. They said, here, we'll provide you lodging and you can do this, that, and other. But you know what? One third of your crop, you got to give me of this, this, yeah. this, or yeah. they don't provide any food for them, but they get paid, and then they have to buy their food right. from the, the from the, the store. Yeah, from the yeah. planter. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and it's in one sense, and they did, really didn't change much, except that they were getting some form of compensation for the work because they were still living in the same conditions that they were at. Now, mm -hmm. now there's also free people that access the Freedmen's Bureau and also the U.S. colored troops. The mm -hmm. soldiers also were there for assistance. And I also like, um, Bernice does the thing at Maggie about slave ads and stuff. Mm -hmm. yes. Well, you had these people... <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Well, Laura, you had a question? Yeah. <laughs> hey, um, so I was just looking at the National Archives website, and um, if I didn't know anything about the Freedmen's Bureau's records, I think I would be a little lost because they have headquarters records, state records, field office records, marriage records, adjunct 
ed that I can't say that word general op general's office records. So how would somebody get started? They just maybe have a more. and they maybe have a last name in a state. How would they get started? Well, first of all, they need to. And you did, you're right. They have all of these different uh, divisions that are pretty much outlined on the NARA website. But to get started, the first thing I would do is recommend that they download the microfilm publication because the publication will then describe what uh, roles are available and how to access that information. If they don't have the publication, and this is what the, this, oh, you can't see it. But anyway. There you go. There you now go. I can see it. Okay, so <laughs> this, is, this is a publication book. And I carry this book with me everywhere I get. It's a descriptive pamphlet. Yeah. Go to the state that you're looking for. And this is a descriptive pamphlet for South Carolina. It's M1910. Uh, get your descriptive pamphlet. Scroll through your descriptive pamphlet to study what's in there. So I'm looking at South Carolina, and they have the Register of Contracts from May 1866 mm -hmm. to May 1868. So you can then find those contracts and then go through those contracts. They also break some of the contracts down in alphabetical order. So from A to let's say A to C and B to D, you know, they'll break it down so that you at least know where you're going. And if you're in the full state, it'll break it down by the town or the, uh -huh. as I said, is that you have field offices uh -huh. and where yeah. you want to go. So that's how I would tell people to study this. It's, it's a book. It's, it's, it's not me just telling you. It's you getting your book, downloading it, and reading it, and understanding uh -huh. what's in it and how to right. navigate the Freedman Bureau records. Right. It's so important to, to know and understand the records before we jump in and try to search something. Because a lot of times... We'll look for something and can't find anything, get frustrated, and then find out, well, it never was contained in this record anyway. So you've spent Correct. all this time. Yes, so, yes. So, Shelly, once once you've done that and you've studied, where then do you go to find the records? Have they been digitized? I know that there's some have, but and some haven't, right? They're not all digitized yet, or am I wrong about that? Okay, the, the records are online. You have okay. the, the Smithsonian, uh, the African American Museum. You mm -hmm. can go and get those records from there. And if you let me, I'll show you. Um, sure. I'm, I'm going to go to Sova. <laughs> we all get all excited. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, show us, show us. <laughs> Hold on one second. I need to share my, uh-oh, what yeah. happened? Uh -oh, you should be, I've got it set so that you can. Okay, so let me see if I can pull up my screen now. Let me close it back one more time. And then, uh oh, I pulled up the wrong document. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Here it is. Okay. Can you there see you that? Yes. 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 Okay, so let me. Okay, so this is. Uh, the records of the field offices for the state of Louisiana. Okay, so here, if I scroll all the way up, you can see everything that's in the field office. You see that? Uh, yes. The Freeman Employment Register of Black Persons, Register hmm. of Letters, uh, Freeman Labor Contracts, and then they break down by parish where the records are. You see that? Oh, that's yeah. wonderful. All the way down. Okay, so here's a parish. This is uh, Lafouche. Mm -hmm. Then, okay, you go in here. Here's some records. And then you just start pulling up records. You see that? Yeah. It's like, it's mm -hmm. almost like a slide presentation. Okay. Look at all of the names. Mm -hmm. Can you see all of the names here? Yes. 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 See that? Look at that. Wow. Yeah. Absolutely. One third of the crop raised. I'll 
on the plantation to be divided among the laborers at the end of the year. Huh. Okay, so there it wow. is. But you also, you see, it's in writing, mm -hmm. the agreement with the freedmen. These are the things that the freedmen are agreeing to. Mm -hmm. And then here they are. I mentioned classification. Well, they didn't classify them at mm -hmm. all. Some of the records do. Now, this is another one. They named the, okay, so they're naming the plantation. So this mm -hmm. is what I, when I recommend that you go to the community and then document the names of all of the plantations. So you have a beginning, you know what's in your community. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you can start, start working it. I gotcha. And that's a fancy labor contract too. That's a very fancy <laughs> labor contract. That's Louisiana. Now, let's say we go to South Carolina, you may not find this. You may find just a handwritten contract uh -huh. where the laborer might say, um, you're a former slave and you're going to do what you did before. And, <laughs> and that was it. And I'm yeah. happy. And I'm happy with you. So just keep doing what you did before. Yeah. And, that, and, <laughs> and that's the end of it, really. Yeah. Seriously. Wow. So all online then. I, I didn't realize, but, well, they're, but they're not, when you go to Smithsonian, they're not indexed though. So you can't just type in a name or is anything? No, indexed? you can, you cannot just type in a name, but okay. you can go, you, you have to scroll. That's a, that's mm -hmm. community okay. research. Yeah. You have mm -hmm. to scroll through your county or your par right. in Louisiana's parish. Mm -hmm. If I was in South Carolina, my research place would be Edgeville. Mm -hmm. So I would go to the Aiken Field Office because that's where it is. And I would just scroll through those records. Um, and you, you just, it, it, it requires work. I know people want it to be instant. Uh, you can yeah. go to Family Search. You know, in Family Search, you have the Discover the Freedmen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can go to Discover the Freedmen and at least put the first and the last name and see what happens. But mm -hmm. they also have it set up that you can put in, it is indexed. Some of the names are indexed and you can mm -hmm. put in the names of the people you're searching for on uh, family search. Mm -hmm. You also have the wiki. Family search has the free. Ah, oh, yes. Right. And that will help people really understand. Just as I said, you study the pamphlet, read mm -hmm. the pamphlet study the wiki and have the wiki take you to the areas that you want to do your research. Fabulous. Now, now in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, if I know a name and if I go to family search and I put it in the little search box and it shows up that there's some records about my people, isn't that going to kind of help point to other records that I need to go look? The ones that aren't would that be a little bit helpful to, to go there and, and see where they're showing up and then go find the other records about that, that place? Certainly, that would help. I know mm -hmm. on Family Search, if I put, and I know my ancestors on the Freedman Bureau, but mm -hmm. if I'm just, if I just put his name in, where he's mm -hmm. from, his birth, when he was born and when he died, he mm -hmm. doesn't, show, it, it won't, it hasn't ah. taken to the Freedman Bureau. I actually okay. had to go to the Freedman mm -hmm. Bureau to find okay. him. So I guess they're not sinking yet or mm -hmm. some okay. people, maybe they do, but mine hadn't synced to the point where I could put in the name and it okay. takes me to the Freedman Bureau. I had to take myself to the Bureau <laughs> and, so, and study it. Don't, don't get frustrated if you do go to Family Search and, and put some names in the search engine, doesn't come back. That doesn't mean your people aren't in there. That That's just means correct. it works indexed indexed correctly or it's just not linking to the right mm -hmm. record yet that's yeah. correct mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. now melissa you said you had another question um yeah just a couple of uh parameter questions i guess um uh, um what what date range are the freedman bureau records i mean okay. obviously after the civil war 18 what 66 but then how long, how far can we 65 yeah. 1865 and they said 1872 but some places they shut down in 1868 
And, okay. Yeah. 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 So you have to really look to see what's happening in that particular state in the field office when, mm-hmm. when the money was just taken and they pulled out. And yeah. Life were, totally are changed. Are all the states again. representative that were states at the time? The Confederate states, yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm thinking Tennessee. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not well, Texas, yeah. but Tennessee. Tennessee. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I do Tennessee and Texas. And there's well, different levels. Shelly, I, I, ac- you know, I accidentally said that uh, that Melissa was from I know. <laughs> Texas. That's why I was saying, yes, Tennessee. And, you know, Shelly just mentioned that the Virginia Bureau's field offices are indexed on families. Oh, yeah. oh very oh. nice. Very and nice. only at the field office level, though. You got the other levels that she mentioned earlier, districts or commissioner levels, mm-hmm. you know, and things. And also, one of the things I like to look at is following the reports. All the yes. field offices, because they're the field offices are run by the military. So think okay. about it. if there's yeah. a document, there's going to be continual documents. Mm-hmm. If there's a complaint filed, there's going to be a hearing and there's going to be a resolution. Okay. And so you have to, sometimes the records will trigger another record. So gotcha. if you see that, yeah, the court hearing or a complaint filed, mm-hmm. now you want to find out what happened. It's a court hearing. It tells you about the case whatever it is, yeah. but you've got the different levels that are definitely not indexed. And the mm-hmm. first thing I oh, go sure. to is miscellaneous records because that's where I find the best finds. <laughs> I'm looking in the right state, but I go yeah. to the miscellaneous. But another thing that's a good one that works with me, that I use a lot on the Freeman's Bureau is the marriage records because this is where somebody formerly enslaved and, and the scenario would be that coming into the Freedman Bear office, uh-huh. my name is Shelly. This is my husband. We've been together for the last five years. And these are our children. Gotcha. And this was our former owner. So now you got when the two folks came together. And typically, and I'm only speaking for Virginia marriage records, there is some consistency, but how you they're presented is different. Uh-huh. You know, like she said, a handwritten, some are right. in a form, some aren't, some are in columns that are hand drawn, mm-hmm. and some are in a printed type column. Right. But the marriage record will ask for their name and their ages, and then what their occupation is in their residence. Mm-hmm. But what's very awesome about these records, it will say the husband or wife was married before. And had one oh. of the kids to give the kids names. Wow, the, that's know, fabulous. And so you can just keep going and keep going. Right. It's, it's a deep dive in here because mm-hmm. you can't just look at one. It will trigger questions. Right. which will tell you to go look for something else. Absolutely. Well, what, I'm seeing, what I'm seeing too, and I, and I have looked through some of these records, is that it's not just you, you start looking for your people, but then you start reading stories. You've got mm-hmm. those complaints. You've got all yes. these other things that adds to the story. So you you don't want to just stop at oh I found them that they're on this plantation and they were doing this this time to this time. You you want to just keep going and find That's out right. everything. That's right. Well, well, because Mara, you said, oh, go ahead. community, like you mentioned, Bernice, mm-hmm. you start going in there. And everybody's from that area. They could go mm-hmm. to any field office, but nine times out of 10, you're looking at the community and wow. your people and everybody that's around there. Yeah, it's that makes sense. Amazing. And, yeah. and can you imagine, I mean, looking in the community and going in 1870 census and you start seeing other things that's happening. Mm-hmm. Some of them are marrying each other. Uh, they are neighbors and mm-hmm. uh, it's, it just gives you a bigger picture about what happened. What what did freedom really mean to people? Because right. you start seeing they started school maybe in the as part of the Freedmen Bureau, but you're also going to see in 1870 those children are in school. Yes. And yes. which is very exciting when you see that yeah. the children are in school, or uh, even uh, a teenager is in school. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and that's something that started during the Freedmen Bureau period. Mm-hmm. Laura, you said you had another question? Yeah, it's a slightly tangential. It's more of a historical question than a question okay. about the records. Um, 
one thing that struck me as very, very sad. I was down at um, Calhoun Plantation near Charleston, mm -hmm. and that plantation was considered um, confiscated or abandoned. And there was one uh, freedman who throughout the Civil War maintained the property. And mm -hmm. after the war was over, he was still there. He went through the Freedmen Bureau process and was awarded the lands. But it didn't last very long. The ancestors, the family, they all got their, their fancy lawyers. Mm -hmm. And after everything had been through and he finally had land of his own, it was taken away from him again. And yeah. I was just wondering how common that was and how successful the freedmen were at being able to keep the lands that they were awarded. You know, Laura, I think it really depended on the community because you certainly had the the beginnings of the clan and mm -hmm. the people that were basically intimidating, killing, doing everything they could to throw people off the land. So again, it just depends on what was happening in the community and how much protection mm -hmm. they had and support they had in the community. Thank these you. are these are these are absolutely fascinating, fascinating records. And I think sometimes like um, like Melissa had said when she asked her question about who is included in these records is we need to we need to not put records in a little pile. These are African American mm -hmm. records. Absolutely. These are yeah, these records belong to this group of people. This, you know, people we we talked about communities. People lived in communities. So this was recording a community not just, you know, a specific, you know, type of people. It was, it right. was, it was right. the community. And so we right. can find our ancestors in any records really that deal with the community. And sometimes I think we get some blinders on mm -hmm. when we're looking. Right. We're like, oh, yeah. my people wouldn't be in those records. Of course right. they would. Which, which of course, <laughs> you can find your person, your, your uh, family member could have been one of the adjudicators. Right, and right. could have could have denied uh, a planter's uh, mm -hmm. contract because mm -hmm. he felt it was unfair, and yeah. you might see your ancestor stating, "No, this cannot be." Scratching mm -hmm. it out, sending it back, making them renegotiate again. So you have to look at the roles that people played in this in bureau. The bureau. Exactly, exactly. They, like I said, they're fascinating, fascinating records. So we've talked about what they are and where you can find them. And do you have a method, Bernice, as you are going through all these records to keep track of what you're finding and keeping people straight and communities straight? Like, do you do a <laughs> charts or, or, or you just have it all up here? <laughs> well, I, I have a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. And the spreadsheet would start with the plant, the name of the plantation the name of the owner, uh, of course, the location, mm -hmm. and then the names of the, uh, the laborers. Mm -hmm. And that's a good way that way you can see if you're, you're tracking the same people because you can keep putting all yes, on your, you, on your and, spreadsheet. And, yeah. Yes, and I mean, I, I, when people have a, a chance to look at the legacy webinar, mm -hmm. they'll see a case study where I actually tracked a person. I mean, track them all the way to, to death. And you have to be able to, first of all, in your head, you know what you're doing. I'm tracking yeah. this person. And it was right. not a family member, but I tracked that person all the way to the point where the woman was 105 years old when she passed away. Wow. And she was on a Freeman Bureau record. Yes. Hmm. Wow. Wow. That's 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 fabulous. I love that. And we will definitely put a link to everything that we've talked about tonight, including your legacy yeah. webinar. Um, so for those of yeah. you that are are uh, have a legacy membership, you can just go in there and, and watch it at any time. For those of you who, who aren't, why not? Mm -hmm. <laughs> fabulous, um, fabulous webinars on there that you can watch all the time. I think everybody, almost everybody on this panel has done something for legacy at one point or another throughout the years. So <laughs> there's all sorts of things on there. Um, 
Let's see. Yeah, Let me see. If... Roots Tech. I did one on the. Oh, and there's some things on Roots Tech too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Roots Tech one. Yes. Don't forget those. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. There's so much information out there, and don't be intimidated by a record set. You know, mm -hmm. learn about it. Learn about it first, and and understand how the record set works. So you're not searching for something you're not going to be able to find because your person could have possibly been in there, been there, done that as a baby genealogist. <laughs> and so there, yeah, there's nothing more frustrating than realizing your person couldn't be in there because, it, you know, they weren't old enough or, you know, the circumstances mm -hmm. or, or whatever. But, but yes, learn about these records. Does anybody have a, another question before we? I do. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, I don't know. I don't know if you can answer this one, but. Of course, this is what the genealogist, but also the archivist in me. Mm -hmm. um, how would the Freedmen's Bureau or the I'm guess, of the government at the time advertised or notified the wow. communities that come here and do you know? Fabulous how would, would, would it have been in the newspaper? Would it how would would it have been like you know handbills tacked up places? Have, you, have either one of you ever done research or son, seen any kind of evidence of how they would have done that? Can, Bernice, I'm gonna I'm gonna say something. This is how I explain it, and I'll let her do it the, the, the right <laughs> way. I tell people when the war was over, the horses, the soldiers were coming in, telling them to go to the field offices to get assistance. And, mm -hmm. and if there wasn't a field office, they told them where to go, which is another clue that if there's not one in the county that you're researching on mm -hmm. that map in the Freedmen Bureau site that Tony mm -hmm. and Angela did, you can see they pinged every one of the field offices in the states where they're allowed. And mm -hmm. when you pop that up, it takes you right into family search where the field um, office records are. So it's a so great they, So they actually that, had to physically go, did they actually physically have to go to the office? And the reason I'm asking this question is because um, I, I live in a rural area. At the, at the time, mm -hmm. it wasn't that rural, although it kind of was. And so I just wondered if you couldn't get to an office, was there any other option for you to get in touch with them? Well, first of all, you had field agents that went to the plantations okay, and they good. did plantation inspections and uh -huh. they documented information about what was happening at each plantation. Oh, okay, In fact, good. when you start looking at the plantation reports, they, they may say, and the laborers are happy. I mean, you know, <laughs> but this is how much, you know, they talk about the crops. They talk about everything else. We're still talking about the economy. We're still talking uh -huh. about money. Uh -huh. And so those plantation, uh, those plantations had to follow certain guidelines. Remember, the government is now in charge. Uh, yes. You see that the government is in yes. charge. Remember, you can't you can't have someone sign a contract unless that contract is approved. Mm -hmm. So understand, plus the government was charging a tax to the plantation owners for each black laborer, oh, $3. Okay. And that tax, and I'm, I'm going to Louisiana, but that tax <laughs> was used to support the bureau. And ah, other things mm -hmm. that they do because they they really didn't have enough money to do mm -mm. what they needed to do. Mm -mm. So they had benevolent societies. They had mm -mm. to get uh, confiscated equipment from the government to help some of the plantation owners. So it was all hey, look. It's bureaucracy, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? And, yeah. and and that's why <laughs> you have so much documentation. Because mm -hmm. you had to. So, you know, to answer your question, oh, yes, they went to each, each plantation and they Wonderful. took, they registered these people because some people said, I'm not going back to that plantation. I'm going mm -hmm. somewhere else. So mm -hmm. they would have the previous owner and the present, I mean, the previous mm -hmm. owner and location and the present. Uh, okay. And they might. They might be somewhere in 1865 and somewhere different in 1866. Right. They were moving. Right. They yeah. were moving and they right. moved. It was right. word of mouth, you yeah. know? Mm -hmm. but they moved. They got out of there. <laughs> Not to mention the people that 
were forcibly migrated to a place, they mm -hmm. wanted to go back home. So uh, they had yeah. to get the transportation to go mm -hmm. back home. Gotcha. All of that's documented. And Fabulous. that's the beauty of, of these records because mm -hmm. it's federal. I mean, it's mm -hmm. all there. It's mm -hmm. just that it takes a lot of time for people right. to really go through the records. So I'm, I'm with you with saying, look, don't think of this as just an African-American set of records. Mm -hmm. Think mm -hmm. of it this as a record of the community. It's an American mm -hmm. record of right. what happened during a period of transition that mm -hmm. our country went through. Mm -hmm. from splitting up to coming back and yeah. what happened during that period of time. I there love are that. so many different avenues and now I'm coming with my archivist brain here, uh, but because mm -hmm. I think I can see, you know, Jeannie Allen, fantastic. But mm -hmm. as, like you talked about <laughs> community, you know, you can document a community with oh, these absolutely. records. Now our absolutely. county was not formed until 1871, but we, our county was formed from three other counties surrounding us. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I can see where we would go, but I know the names that were here, you know, at that time. And so as an archivist trying to document our local history, uh -huh. these records I think would be very uh, interesting to look oh, at. Yes, for, absolutely. I agree with for, you. Um, archiving and preserving some of this local history. So mm -hmm. thank you so much, Bernice and Shelley. This yeah. has really been interesting. That one before, last comment on uh, that before okay. you go. Remember this. This is one time they had choice. Mm. My name is mm. Shelley. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean it was my former slave owners. Right. Name. Yep, right. exactly. The name that I wanted to take, and that was the first choice. Mm -hmm. they, and think of the movie that's Harriet. If you're that's a very good point. He, he, him asking her, well, mm -hmm. what name would you like? And she took her mother's real name and mm -hmm. her husband's name, and that was Harriet Tubman. So there was the choice that they were able to take on. And, mm -hmm. and some people never had a surname. Right, but they had the chance to give one mm -hmm. when they were at the bureau, so right. that's another and, fact. Right, and I contend that everybody had a surname. It's mm -hmm. just that you, you, didn't, you didn't know, know it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you yeah. didn't they know it, yeah. but they did have a surname. They did. They yeah. did. That's okay. all you have to do is read some Civil War files. I know, <laughs> <laughs> and they will that's tell you the name. <laughs> yeah, and you know, but. And a yeah. lot of times it could have been something that leads you to their parents. Exactly. Or, or somewhere they formerly mm -hmm. lived or something. Mm -hmm. And it's just a fascinating, um, I'm in it just about every day. That, you know, because- now, Shelley, heard, speaking, of, speaking of that, speaking of that, before we go, you do something on Fridays with the Friedman yes. Bureau. Watch it. Would you tell everybody about that before we go? I will. I will. It is called Freedman Bureau Friday, 7 o'clock Eastern Time. And you can find the link. And I mean, it's every Friday, even holidays. And we'll put the link in this too, so they can find it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so it's a pin link on Facebook under Finding Enslaved Laborers at UVA. And uh -huh. so we always have new people. It could be 20, 30 people. Sometimes we throw people in break rooms and whatever. But the first, say, hour and a half or two hours, we will review things that, you know, Bernice covered. Here's how mm -hmm. you, here's, here's what the records are about. This is how you access them. Let's look at them. And this is what you can do with them, you know, do Wonderful. a timeline and research. And it's open to anyone. My main focus is concentrating on Central Virginia counties, mm -hmm. and most of the people that come are somehow connected to Virginia, but it doesn't matter because you heard me mm -hmm. mention, you know, Tennessee or uh, Louisiana. We're looking at records, but we're also there to help people if they can't mm -hmm. find someone. How do you maneuver through these records? Because that's, that's a wonderful, so wonderful thing that you're doing. That's fabulous. That's so. It was my job. That's the only <laughs> way I could reach out. It's a win-win situation, right? Yes, 
win win yeah. situation. Yeah. So thank you for mentioning yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. And and Bernice, thank you so, so much. Mm -hmm. Because I've used these records before, yeah. but you've helped me understand how to use them better. And so I really, really appreciate all of your tips and tricks and hints and and Shelly, your experiences too has it just it's been wonderful tonight. So you guys always send me down a rabbit trail. I always <laughs> stop what I'm supposed to be doing and then go, sorry, and sorry for oh, the dogs. Like, they had just I know my cats. My cat's meowing. So we got dogs, yeah. cats, me saying wrong things. I mean, it's just welcome to Jen Friends. Isn't it typical? It's just the way we roll. That's, that's, that's it. Yes. Roll. That's perfect. Absolutely. Perfect. So we will we will have all the links uh, for you to get to and, and uh, find out more information. And we would love to hear from you. What have you found? Have you been researching in these records? And what have you found? We would love for you to share that. So make sure you leave a comment either on the YouTube page or on the blog post and let us know what you found. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Bernice. Thank you, Shelly. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Laura. And thank you, Melissa in Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> Next time. Bye. Bye, friends. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>